Hello, my dear friends. Um, today we have the pleasure of having our dear Anne Baring with us. Uh, for the people who don't know her, she is one of the authors who have brought to our attention the importance and the relevance of the divine feminine. And this, not just from a spiritual point of view, but from a psychological, spiritual, sociological point of view, she's a very scientific-minded person. And I really recommend to you her book, The Dream of the Cosmos, A Quest for the Soul. And this is not a, a, her only book, but uh, uh, we, I like to mention this one because this will be behind a lot of the conversation that we're going to have today. We decided to get together because we are deeply moved by the current events uh, in the world, wars, and the worst representation of the separation and violence. And this is what we're going to be talking about today, the big question of what can we do to change this consciousness? What can we do to end the escalation? So, and let's kick off with that big question, let's start disentangling. What can we do to stop this violence? I think one of the major things that we could do is to change our image of God. <laughs> because we have an image of God which, who is separate from ourselves. But if we understood what quantum physics is telling us, that we are all part of the being of God, and God is something quite different from what we've been taught over the last 2,000 years or whatever, then we might be able to shift our consciousness. Then it might be possible to real, uh, for governments to realize that in making ever more and more weapons and escalating the weaponry, so to speak, they're actually injuring the body of God. Yeah. Oh, I so love important. your answer. And this makes me think about, uh, I live in the Netherlands, in the Netherlands, many churches ha uh, have been closed, closed, and many people will tell you that they, uh, they are um, uh, atheist. And, uh, and um, my re first reaction will be, what about these people who think that God doesn't even exist? Well, they, they're quite right, because he doesn't exist in the format that we've been told. So they're, they're accurate, and I wouldn't deny them the, the fact that um, they say there is, they don't believe anymore and there's no such thing as God, because we've been given a totally wrong concept of God. And because we've been indoctrinated in that concept for at least 2,000, if not 3,000 years, it's extremely difficult to step outside it. It's like dropping off a suit of clothes and, and putting on a new one. But if you move, what quantum physics is telling us is that we are all connected at the deepest level of um, subatomic matter, as I'm sure you know, we're connected through something called the Planck units and then the protons. And these are all connected to each other. They're all vibrating in patterns of um, fields, if you like. We don't see them, but they are what we are. And if we realize that what we've called God is simply the life of the whole universe, including all the 200 billion galaxies, including us on this planet, including every life element on this planet, we would begin to realize that in making weapons, we're really destroying ourselves. We're really building up um, the forces of destruction, which come back at us in the form of a Putin, or of a, a, whoever who is going to be the next aggressor. And then we start again to, to um, use these weapons against each other, wiping out millions of people possibly with the latest weapons. The, the one that Putin has developed can wipe out the whole of Ukraine in one bomb. Can you imagine yeah, the, de the, the depravity that we've sunk into mm -hmm. in creating these weapons? But if you say this to any government, A, they think you're mad, and B, they pay no attention, and C, <laughs> that they will go on with the same pattern because they don't know any other pattern. There's no other pattern. No. I have uh, been, uh, I have heard uh, answers even by, by women that we, that 
you know, this, uh, uh, I cannot use harsh words, but you know, just, it, it's about more violence. Let's kill, let's attack, let's, uh, the bad guys. <laughs> Anybody yeah. who, who's the bad guy. Uh, uh, Putin and Trump and, uh, you know, whatever go, uh, big guy. But then he's, and it's aggression over aggression. And for me, it's so obvious that if you have a little aggression, then you escalate and then you escalate and you escalate and it goes bigger and bigger and bigger. What can we do with the bullies? I mean, well, being nice and uh, it's... Uh, uh, I don't think we, can, we can't sort of change the character of any particular bully, but we can raise the consciousness of the whole of humanity to realize this pattern is completely wrong and eventually has to come to an end. Because again, there's another aspect. If we are part of nature, which we are, and we are part of the cosmos, then what we do to hurt nature comes back at us in the form of another attack, another Putin. So if we change our relationship with nature and realize that we're completely out of step with the cosmos as a whole and with God as a whole, then things will start to change because you're going to change the pattern at the very deepest level of subatomic matter in realizing that we're part of nature and we can't destroy nature by making these weapons. But if we go on that pattern, the weapons are going to get more and more powerful, more and more destructive, and instead of wiping out two or three million, they'll wipe out 50 million or whatever and destroy the earth in the process. And this is because of our unconsciousness of what the whole pattern of weaponry and war has been doing for, for as I've said before, for 4,000 years we've been in it. So it's very deep and very strong, but with it is the wrong concept of God, completely the wrong concept of God and the wrong concept of nature because everything is one. You can't split off nature from God, as we have done in the Christian tradition. You have to bring everything back together into one unit of divinity, really. The whole thing is divine. The whole thing is God. The whole thing is spirit. Yeah. Um, from my point of view, this is, obviously, I'm, I'm, not, I'm speaking for myself. <laughs> but I, well, I, know but you, I, I know you understand, because you're a scientist yourself, and you can understand the scientific point of view, as well as this other point of view. I think it's undeniable. Whoever uh, wants to say that we're separated hasn't read any modern science. It's undeniable that everything is one. We are one with Pluto and with the butterfly and with uh, the past and with the future. But we are seduced by this idea of separation because you are in another physical body, I'm in this physical body for these 4,000 years, but uh, there was another way of being that in your book, you call it the, the moon era. Yeah, and, the moon era. And, uh, moon. and many people have no clue what that is. How could we have lived differently without war, without uh, hierarchies? What is that? It's so alien, but it existed. Please tell us about it because it's so valuable. So it's, it was really, um, it's Jules Cashford and I who wrote the myth of the goddess. We uh, created this word, the lunar era and the solar era to describe a very long period in our history when we had a totally different relationship with the cosmos and with the great mother, because at that time, the image of deity that we worshipped and felt close to was the great mother. And that lasted for at least 25,000 years, many, many years during the Paleolithic and the Neolithic. After the Neolithic, it changed into the becoming the great father instead of the great mother. But during those 25,000 years, we felt connected with the whole cosmos. We felt connected with nature because people knew then they had what's called a participatory consciousness in which they participated in the life around them. They learned the language of the birds. They learned the language of the animals. They learned the language of plants, like the shamans of Peru uh, know today. You know, there are shamans all over the planet who know what I'm talking about. And you have to go to the shamanic societies to <coughs> discover what we've lost. And they recover it with sacred plants. 
But sacred parts were always used. They were used in the Paleolithic and the Neolithic and right the way through until they were prevented by uh, the Christian, um, you know, the, the forces of Christianity, which put a stop to all that because they put a stop to what's called animism. That is to say that the whole of nature was alive. They didn't like that. They wanted all the attention to go on to God in heaven and not to have nature full of spirit. And so they killed it deliberately. Um, you can go back to the early years of Christianity, how they wiped out all the pagan culture completely and destroyed all the pagan temples and things. And But beyond that, earlier than that, they also destroyed whatever seemed to them to be um, the work of the devil. That's what they called it. Shamanism was the work of the devil. So... Christianity's had huge mistakes, <coughs> which have not been acknowledged, <coughs> least of all by the papacy, although the present Pope is a lovely man. Mm. Yeah, I and totally he, feel and know what you are talking about because I'm Mexican and uh, I was raised uh, <laughs> uh, at home. We were taught uh, we are the Aztecs and we the Aztecs. And there is there are stories in which the uh, the Spanish wanted the, the Catholics wanted to build this and that, and they couldn't. They didn't know because of the technology or uh, where to find this and that. And they will say this will be for the Virgin Mary or the Virgin whatever. And uh, what the uh, Aztec builders did was to find a beautiful representation of our Mother Goddess and bury her. <laughs> bury her underneath mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I could say uh, I could dare to say that 100% of the churches in, uh, in I could say in Latin America in Mexico in Peru maybe uh, but in Mexico uh, uh, that they, they they are sacred places ancestral sacred places uh, and somehow I laugh because we have this saying in Mexico that we think we were uh, buried, but they didn't know that we are seeds. And I think that seed is starting to, to come up right now. Come up again. Well, I think that what, what has happened all over the world is that the shamanic consciousness was repressed and eliminated wherever possible. So we have to recover that. And maybe we need to go to these societies and ask for help from them saying, will you teach us how to do what you're able to do and what, what we have forgotten and teach us to remember what we once knew. And because it's so important, it would put us back in touch with nature. It would put us back in touch with the cosmos and we would be far more humble as a species, realizing that we had a lot to learn to, to remember this ancient knowledge that was known for thousands and thousands of years. So this is what I call the lunar era. This is the wisdom of the lunar era. And it was passed down through the Egyptian temple tradition, for, in, for example, and it was from there it went into alchemy. So we have it in the um, in European tradition, we have it in the alchemical tradition in, uh, in Central Europe, and we have it also in the Rosicrucian tradition. But both of those were um, repressed by the Catholic Church so that nobody dared to speak about it in public. It was all secret. So this tradition was passed down from uh, teacher to pupil for hundreds and thousands of years, really. But it's all there still. It's, it's latent and it can be brought back. In fact, in your country, you've got a marvelous place called the Embassy of the Free Mind. Yeah, yeah, which is the which is the center of all the alchemical manuscripts gathered together from all over the world. So the Netherlands is really the center of alchemy at the present time with this marvelous library of manuscripts. Um, so that would be one place to go to recover connection with this tradition. But you can also go back to the Hermetic tradition of Egypt and study that, or you can go to the Peruvian shamans of um, South America and learn from them. And all of these different traditions probably had sacred plants that they used. I, I won't name them because I don't really know about them, but the sacred mushrooms or the, what the Indians called the Soma plant, mm -hmm. they were all known to these cultures, to the Hindu culture, for instance, that's another aspect that um, was repressed by Christianity probably when, it, when they took over India. So there's great wisdom there. 
uh, Blanca. There's great you know, wisdom. I, I find it exhilarating to to think to and, and humbled by the fact of being alive at this historical moment. Uh, we are really moving from the solar era to to this new St era of, of empathy, of cooperation, of oneness. Uh, I'm reading right now the book of Maria Tartar, The Heroine with Thousand and One Faces. And she talks about that women, the qualities of the heroic uh, woman, of uh, the heroine, is curiosity and storytelling. And if we are curious to remember the plants, uh, the methods of the uh, ancestors, and we tell the story, we could actually bring this peace that we want. We could actually influence those men to, to, to raise their consciousness. Yes, I think so, because with children, you have children, I know, and I have um, a grandson who is now in his 20s. But if we took children out into the forest and said to them, now, if you listen very carefully, you might hear the language of the birds. Or if you very, listen very carefully, you might find the language of a squirrel that you see running around. Or, you know, get children conscious that there is a way of communicating with nature. That would be one way. And also talking to the trees. That's another way because they did this and they talked to the rocks and stones and, and the streams that and made the stream sacred because they could sort of, they knew which were the sacred streams that would speak to them. All that kind of thing. The Greeks knew this. Yeah. The, the, the Greeks knew this very well. And um, so did it to some extent, some of the Roman era, but it was all lost, as I said, with the coming of Christianity and also the coming of Islam, because Islam was dead against all this sort of magical thinking. They, they had to kill it out, um, except for the Sufis who understood. Yeah, with the, the, the dances and coming back to that consciousness exactly. as they coming turn, back turn, to turn, the turn. Experience, to the experience of remembering, that's what they're doing when they're twirling like that. Yeah. So this is a fascinating conversation and I hope it will help people who are going to listen to it to understand that there is another way of being and it's much to do with being rather than doing it's to do with listening and remembering and making time for doing nothing at all uh, in your busy day just to be very quiet for half an hour and look around you and see what you can connect with um, what you can listen to really um, and that will they, there's a man called um, Makimoto or something like that in Japan who has discovered that water can understand our language if we speak kindly to water and thank it for its gift of a life, really. Um, it knows. And the crystals of water change when it's spoken to kindly. And if it's spoken to unkindly, they also change into a, a, a pattern which shows it's unhappy. So this is fascinating. This is I can't remember his name, but I think it's- Emoto, I believe. Emoto, Emoto yes. Emoto. And he's got little books you can buy, which tell you about all this. And that's fascinating. This came out about 10 years ago, I think, or possibly more. And there's also homeopathy that people ridicule, the scientific mind ridicules that, <coughs> but it's very valuable. So um, specifically for women, and um, what would you say that the women, uh, and, um, you know, I, I think uh, I, I have focused, my heart really goes to the women who have felt not good enough for so long. And to feel better, they try to fit in by being in corporations, becoming engineers, you know, being the masculine. Uh, to these women who are tired and almost burning out and feeling helpless with the war and violence, what could you say to especially those ones? I would say not to be distressed because we're coming through from a very, very difficult past because woman's voice was silenced for 4,000 years and we're only just beginning to recover it in the last 100 years, but even barely that. And because of the, I, I go back to the 
story of the fall of man and Eve's role in that and taking the apple because of that story, which has been distorted out of all proportion by Christianity, made the central plank of its teaching, uh, we've been told was sinful. And the, the person who introduced sin was Eve. So all women have been tainted or um, well, tainted with the sin of Eve, the so-called sin of Eve. Well, she, she was only taking the apple possibly to give it to Adam to taste, what a good taste it had. You know, th this story has been uh, exaggerated beyond all possibility of exaggeration into a story of sin and guilt. And that burden of sin and guilt was mainly placed on Eve's shoulders and therefore on all women's shoulders. So if women could become aware of that story and just boot it out of their lives and realize that it's at the root of the misogyny that, that is um, contaminating our culture really, it could help them. And also they have to learn the feminine way of living, which is through the heart not the masculine way, which is through the mind, which is very valid in its own place. But when it takes over everything and you see everything through the rational mind, you're losing the heart. You're cutting out the heart, literally. And so I would say to them to sit quietly before you go out on your work, whatever it might be, before you begin your day, sit quietly with your heart, maybe put your hand on your heart and just speak to it and say, what would you like me to do today? How would you like me to live today? Is there anything special that you would like me pay, to pay attention to? Just to give that time to the heart, that would make a huge difference because they would not get into their work, daily life through the mind and say, what have I got to do today? What have I got to do next? Where are my lists? Who am I seeing? What am I doing? <laughs> you know. All that could just be quiet for just a few minutes and connect with the heart. And there's a, a wonderful um, website called Heart Math, which I would recommend that people go to and learn the method of connecting with the heart. So that would be my message to all women today who are struggling to keep things balanced. And I'm going to show, send you a wonderful um, interview with somebody called Marion Woodman, who died about uh, 10 or years ago, I think. She was a Jungian analyst who lived in Canada. And she was quite remarkable because she picked up on this need to balance the masculine with the feminine or the feminine with the masculine. And her work was devoted to that. She's probably not known about now because she, she died a few years ago, but she was a very great woman. And I will send you this interview because it will teach you many things which you could pass on okay. to other women. And I feel so strongly, I mean, I feel so strongly for the women of Ukraine who are victims once again of this terrible attack that they have to suffer, the destruction of their homes, the destruction of safety, the destruction of what they are planning to give their children and the form of a life to grow up in. So much has gone and so much of this is evil, really. It's, it's evil, you have to name it as such, that um, we're confronted with. And I think that to confront evil, as I said in the beginning, you have to change your image of God and realize that um, there's spirit in everything, including the destructive impulse that we see with, with Putin and the Russian onslaught. They don't know what they're doing is what Jesus said, forgive them for they know not what they do. Yeah. And that is so true of much of what we do in our life today. So maybe I've talked enough. Are there any questions? <laughs> you know, like what to comes to me, me when uh, you're saying that is do not give evil our fear. Yeah, that's very true. Absolutely important that because you can see with Ukraine how there is no fear. Yeah. They are full of courage and full of determination to protect their country and their land. And I should say that um, what I've discovered actually very recently is that Ukraine was part of what was called the civilization of old Europe, which was governed by the great mother. It lasted over 3000 years from about 6000 BC to 3500 BC. And so there was a huge area of Eastern Europe, Romania, Moldova, Bulgaria, Greece, Crete, um, Ukraine, which I didn't know about until recently, 
was all part of it. And they had this marvelous culture. It was tremendously creative. It made the most beautiful, huge pots, like as big as this, huge pots. Um, you'll see in my talk that I'm going to send you, I've got a picture there. And so this lasted three and a half thousand years, which is longer than our own era. And this was destroyed by groups of tribes coming down from the Russian steppes. You wouldn't believe it. So we're repeating what happened then, 3,500 years ago is being repeated now, which is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. It's a synchronicity in the Jungian sense. Mm -hmm. Anyway, these tribes came down, they probably thought it was much nicer living in warmer climates and they didn't exactly attack, but they infiltrated. And they brought with them the patriarchal system of hierarchy. They brought with them sky gods. And so they destroyed the whole mother goddess culture and, in, and planted instead sky gods and a hierarchical system with the warrior at the very top and then the priest. And that's what we inherited through the Bronze Age. This is all in a talk that I gave on Monday, which I'm going to send you, which you can pass on to anybody you want. But this is so extraordinary and so tragic that this marvelous culture was destroyed. This artistic, creative, brilliant culture that worshiped the great mother at that time and had wonderful images of her um, should just die and not be discovered until a woman called Marija Gimbutas discovered it. She was Lithuanian archeologist. And for decades, the other archaeologists ridiculed her and said, she's talking nonsense. There's no such thing as this culture. But she was vindicated in 2018 in a talk given in Chicago um, by one of the leading archaeologists. So she was vindicated. And I also found out that there was a Ukrainian archaeologist whose name I can't remember because it's too complicated, <coughs> who at the beginning of the last century made these astonishing discoveries in Ukraine. And probably the, the um, artifacts are in the museum in Kiev, probably. I, I hope they're safe. But anyway, he discovered this amazing culture of pottery makers, black, um, blacksmiths, coppersmiths, goldsmiths, huge amount of beautifully worked gold. These enormous pots, as I said, beautifully decorated with the symbols of nature, uh, symbols of water, symbols of um, springs of sun and moon and stars, all sorts of things. So they were in touch with nature in the sense that I meant this mm -hmm. shamanic awareness. And very possibly they had um, shamanic methods of communion with this other dimension, because this is what is so important. They communicated with the soul of the universe, if you like, or the soul of the planet. Um, they knew how to do it. And we have to remember these methods on at least acknowledge that they existed and that we could rediscover them. Absolutely. I think this is so important. And it was so exciting for me to discover that there was a Ukrainian archeologist at the same time as Marija Gumbutas, but the Soviet Union rejected his findings at the time. So they didn't come into prominent uh, common knowledge of, of all the Russian people who at that time, Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union, but they never knew about this. Yeah. But you can see it's the story of the defeated. Yeah. And, uh, we don't want to tell the story of the defeated. And I think it's the story of, uh, of the feminine. It the is story. the story of the feminine. It's so, the defeated and the rejected and the oppressed and the banished is the word, banished, yeah. completely yeah. obliterated from yeah. consciousness. And the reality is the most powerful because that is the everything that there is. Well, it's the origin. It's the root. It's the matrix of everything. Uh, what else is more than being the origin and the matrix is? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's so, so it's, wonderful to talk it, to you, to have you understand what I'm saying, <laughs> to so, share so, it. it. Yeah, I, I, I find really important to share this and that more women start understanding that the, the relevance of, of sitting in the morning and connecting to your heart, because you're changing all the universe just by doing that. And it That's sounds right. like doing nothing, but it's not doing nothing. It's, it's not uh, uh, perpetuating this escalation of violence. That's right. It's just making space to change the pattern. And also the heart, when you're in touch with the heart, you're in touch with the mag uh, magnetic field of the earth, and then also the wider magnetic field of the whole cosmos. So 
you, it's like getting plugged in with an electric socket. You plug yourself in and then you're connected to everything. Wow. Wow. This one we have to repeat. We plug to the socket of the energy of the universe. That's yeah. what we need to do. That, yeah. That's our homework. Oh, and how delightful. Thank you so much for jumping in. And I hope that uh, we can do it again and, uh, and we can see uh, more women doing this work. I hope so. And men too, because yeah. men need to do that as well before they go off to work in the, in the day sort of thing. Men's consciousness, consciousness has been as deeply wounded as women's because they, they had to shut off the whole feminine side of their nature, the whole feeling heart side had to be carefully controlled and banished mm -hmm. really, because who can fight a war if their heart says, don't go to war, Yeah, you know? I, I think this, is, uh, uh, this would be another conversation that could be interesting or that interests me, because what I see is many men being depressed in their, uh, in their mom's home, playing games and uh, doing pornography and uh, not finding a wife. Uh, quitting uh, studies, quitting uh, uh, quitting ambition, uh, and, and even committing suicide. Many yeah. uh, the uh, suicide among men is going up. Yeah, so it is. I think this is another another, another conversation. conversation. <laughs> that would be lovely. Thank you so much. Oh, thank okay. you. So thank I'll, you. I'll say goodbye for now. But thank you so much. It's been really wonderful for me to share my insights and my experience, yeah, good.